<clears throat> Friends, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we come out of a chaotic, sometimes confusing, often depressing world. And sometimes in our arrogance, we think we've got it worse than anybody ever had. But we know that your Son and our Savior came into a world much like this one. A world of division, angst, anger, and hostility. He came into this world to show us how to live in a world like this and regularly and ongoingly demonstrated love, mercy, and grace. Often he chose to avoid arguments. Most often entered into them with questions, not rebuttals or hostility. And so God, today we ask you to forgive us for the times we participate and the things that we don't like about the world. You have called us to be set aside. You've called us to be your people. We come regularly to hear that old, old story. Remind us of the grace freely given to us with a path that assures us eternity with you. Remind us of the things that matter. Keep us focused on you. It's in that light that we come and we pray for those that we've mentioned earlier that are suffering with illness, some with cancer, some recovering from surgery, some with other medical issues. God, we are all recovering from sin. So today we pray, we pray for your healing touch. Not just on those that have physical illness, but on all of us who need to grow spiritually. We believe that you are the great physician. We believe what we said a while ago, that you have ascended into heaven and you reside at the right hand of the Father. God, we believe that you are the miracle worker, the way maker, that even when we fall astray and go down the wrong path, you still chase us and reach out to us and offer us grace. Jesus came and showed us the way. And when the disciples asked him, he taught us to pray. When he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses that we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, you may remain seated as we sing, ask ye what great thing I know. <coughs>
<clears throat> Stephen, I don't know if Romy's trying to get her mom in or not, but no. Oh, okay. Just we wanted to make sure she didn't need help. Our scripture for the message this morning comes from Jeremiah. I always miss Thomas Lyles being here because he would always say Jeremiah's a bullfrog or something. <laughs> It comes from the 17th chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green in the year of drought. It is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This message seems timely to me when we live in a time when people seem to put trust in everything except God. Amen. I mean, there's people putting trust in the Bengals today, even though the Rams are going to win. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> think again. <laughs> It, 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 apparently, it's illegal to say the word Super Bowl. Now, we have to call it the big game. Oh They've copyrighted that name. I don't know. Uh, right. But uh, it's going to happen. There's going to be a game. And there's a lot of people putting their trust in that. Some people are actually betting a fortune on it. But is that any different than us putting trust in people? It's not going to be the human flesh. That's what this scripture, I think, so clearly points out. I love it at the beginning. It says, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and who make mere flesh their strength. Somehow, we Christians have got to realize that there's more than what we see in this world. The great architect of the universe created all that we can see and all that we do, and yet we want to turn to a human being to be our leader. The Israelites weren't any different. They didn't want a king. I mean, they wanted a king. God said, you don't need a king. God regularly told them, you don't need a king. I'm your king. I'm going to be the leader. And what they said, no, God, we need a king. And so God gave them a king. And gave them another king after that. And another king after that. And every king they ever had fell short. Even David, who was so blessed by God in so many ways, was documented as a sinner. David didn't set out to be a murderer. He set it out to cover up his own sin. I used to be an advocate of the TV show 24. Anybody watch that when it was on? Yep. I was always amazed. I don't know there was, my, my son gave me two seasons of it in CDs for Christmas, and, or DVDs, I guess, and, and uh, I got addicted to it. I just couldn't turn it off. I was up at 3 in the morning watching the next one because you, you, couldn't, you had to go to the next one. You had to find out what's going to happen. Every one of those seasons started off with a brand new president, and that president had ideals and goals, and, and they were set out to do the right thing, and I'm not kidding you, 15 minutes into it, they were making shady decisions. And that's the world we live in, where, where people let us down. Sometimes our children let us down, sometimes our spouse lets us down, sometimes our parents let us down, and I'm quite sure there's plenty of times we let our parents down as well. I know I did. And it's not until we can somehow refocus our goals or set the bar in a different place that we can realize that all of the stuff we feel we're so, uh, I don't know, disgruntled about is really small stuff. It has nothing to do with eternity. This scripture then goes on to say people will be judged, seen, their heart will be seen. I've got to pick it up. Can't we read that far away? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. 
a gazillion years ago when I first got into recovery, there was a guy that was recording a lot of family system things. You could watch them on, uh, I think they were VCR tapes. And, and his name was John Bradshaw. He had been an Episcopalian priest at one time. And, and he made the statement, it has really rung true for me, and I think it rings absolutely true to this scripture. He said, most of us are human doings, not human beings. Do you get the difference? We, 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 we put our, our rank ahead of other things, our financial status above other, above other things, our ability to do stuff above other people. And the reality is, friends, that there are gads of people surrounding this church and every church that don't know who Jesus is. They don't know about the Christ. They don't know about salvation. And therefore they, like it says at the beginning, are wandering around in an uninhabited land in a desert. We need to be the people that are like that tree planted by the river whose roots are deep. Who even in a drought, we know we have plenty of water. Sometimes we live through a drought. I'm not talking about no water. I'm talking about a time when there just seems to be no justice in the world. When there needs to, seems to be no, no equanimity. Where there's classes. I think most of you know I did two terms of study in Mexico City when I was in seminary. Mexico City is a huge place. It's uh, in, the, in the bowl of, of, there was one time a lake and it just got filled in with dirt and people. And about 26 million people in an area the size of Loop 610. So I don't know, Houston's four or five million, six million if you count greater Houston. Put us all inside of 610 and it's still like almost Eight times as many. And in that city, you don't see poverty except in places. And in other places, you see wealth. There was a, a restaurant right down the street from where our seminary was. And we decided we'd go down there to eat. And uh, so we went down there and we found out that even in Mexico, a seven ounce ribeye was like 30 bucks. We looked out in the parking lot, and the only cars in the parking lot were Mercedes and BMWs and Jaguars. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm in this poor country. Well, let me tell you, there's plenty of poor in Mexico, but there's plenty of wealthy. And there's nothing in between. And in so many ways, our country is kind of like that. I don't know what middle class is now anymore. I heard the other day that the average median salary in the United States of America is in excess of $30,000. Seems like a lot to me. I mean, all the people I see coming to our food pantry and the people that I know that are out there struggling, they're not making $30,000. They're making $17,000, $18,000. Rent that was $300 when I was young is $900 now. And we won't even talk about gas prices, but my rebuttal to gas prices is some of you guys are paying six bucks for coffee. So, you know, let's don't talk too much about gas prices. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But, but, but the whole point, I think, of this story is that we need to quit focusing on the stuff that we see in front of us and focus on the stuff that we can't see. Hope is something that we have hope in, but we can't necessarily see something to give us hope. And so how do we Christians, how do we gather to be rooted around the river so that when the world seems to be drying up around us with crime and futility and anger and hostility, we come away with something called peace and justice and mercy and grace. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I find it difficult. I get caught up in the world, too. The world is the world, and, you know, we live in it. Jesus said he was in the world, but not of the world. And he tells us not to be of it either. But it's difficult. Sometimes we have to figure out what it is, how it is that we get that, that emotional or, or, or spiritual feeling so that we know what we know. And I wish I could give you a recipe for it. I wish I could just say, if you'll check this box and this box and this box, you're going to have that heartwarming experience so you'll know that Jesus Christ died for you. 
Even John Wesley. You know, we, we elevate John Wesley, the old founder of the Methodist movement. We elevate him pretty high, don't we? Let me tell you, John was married and separated from his wife. Actually separated from her twice. The last time they stayed separated, and it was in fact one of his trips to London, they advised him his wife had died and had already been buried. They were really separated. John didn't do well in marriage, mainly because he was focused on what he was focused on, somewhat of a workaholic, perfectionist, maybe a little OCD, probably made it hard to live with him. And it'd be easy to say, well, if he's that kind of a guy, how could he have done anything? But that same guy, because of what his principles were and his thoughts and his ways of reaching, he transformed the world. The great enlightenment is in large part because of the work of John. He worked on having a grassroots movement. Now, we hear about grassroots movements all the time, right? There's people out there painting themselves green and hugging trees. I'm not talking about that kind of a grassroots movement. I'm talking about the kind where Jesus becomes the most important thing in our lives. A relationship with Christ becomes the thing that we focus on. And as a result of that, our relationships change. When we see people that are hurting, we don't see low-class people that don't deserve better. We see people that have issues that need to be overcome. And sometimes we can help. I've said this so many times. If churches really did what God calls us to do, we wouldn't need government welfare. We're called to be different. We're called to reach out to the people that are lost or that don't even know they're lost. I have a preacher friend. He's serving over in Beaumont now. And he uh, at one time did a lot of, of ministry to homeless. He may still... But he tells a story about being down under one of the big uh, freeways in a city, and you know, around a, a barrel with some fire in it. We've all seen those things on TV, and they were playing guitars and singing to the people that were there. And he was kind of trying to preach through his presence there and his loving uh, the people that were kind of loveless, if you will. <laughs> one of those homeless guys said. Hey, brother, you talk to us about being lost. What worries me most is you don't seem to think you can be. And we kind of do puff our chest out, don't we? We Christians, we're going to heaven. Come on, Jesus, come today. But Jesus is saying to us, bring all those other folk with you. Amen. I want them all to come. Not just a few. And that's the challenge. When we, we look out in the world, there are people that I despise their attitude. I despise their lifestyle. I despise a lot of things about them. But God calls me to love them and somehow be an example. And sometimes you get to use words. Most often, it's what we do. I was riding with my dad way before I could drive a car I, don't, I think they still have them there. I don't go on Interstate 45 in town much, but they, they used to have a little red light. Some of you remember this. You were supposed to sit there on the feeder street until the light turned green, and then you were supposed to hook them up and get on the freeway. There was always going to be an opening for you. That was the theory. Nobody believed in it much, so there was always a clog at every one of those. And we were in that line getting on the freeway one day, and one of those Houston Metro buses came around us to get on because he was bigger than we were, and he could decide what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. And my dad got our little 62 Comet and revved it up, and he kept him from getting on the freeway. <laughs> I mean, that's really human nature, isn't it? We just want to, we want to, we want to get what we want when we want it, the way we want it, and we want it now. Look at our culture that we live in. You can watch the news; they got a drug for everything. How did we ever live before they had? I don't know, in Tresto and all these other, I can't I remember that one, but there are always, there's commercials for that. And if you watch daytime TV, it's even worse. Everything, you'd think only old people watch it. They're talking about catheters and, and uh, <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. You know, what about the days when we learned about, you know, toothpaste in commercials? <laughs> it's 
So when I think about the scriptures and I think about Christianity and I think about the world, I think about somebody's got to be the one to show love. And I, I, uh, I tell the story on occasion about my first experience in parenthood. My oldest son, he's not here today, so I can talk about him. When he was born, he was, uh, well, we didn't know it. You know, we, we, we never, I'm an only child. I wasn't around ever any babies before. And, uh, my wife was the youngest and she wasn't around any babies. And so we had this brand new baby. We were all excited about it. You know, like everybody that has kids gets excited. And we carried this little guy back up to the pediatrician one week later, like you're supposed to do. And the pediatrician went into a panic, said, oh my gosh, he's got, his belly ribbon is elevated. It's, I don't know, 18 point something. It's way too high. He might have brain damage. You got to do something. Didn't y'all notice he was yellow? And we're thinking, well, we, no. <laughs> And we got home and, and, and we had to go get a, they didn't have all this fancy stuff they had now. We had to go to the shop light and put it over the top of his crib. It was in January, it was cold. We had to have this fluorescent light on him. He couldn't have on any clothes. He had to have a thing over his eyes so we wouldn't fry his eyeballs. And we were just in dismay. We didn't know what to do. We, in fact, we fired one pediatrician because he didn't explain it clear enough. And, and so we, we were sitting, I was sitting out in the backyard on the ground and I was crying, tears were running out of my eyes. I thought my, my son was gonna be brain damaged and the jury's still out on that, but um, I, I thought my son was gonna be brain damaged and it was gonna be a horrible life. I didn't know what we were gonna do and my old Irish setter came over there and sat down next to me and started licking the tears off my eyes. Now, you know, let me tell you about my Irish setter. His name was Bo, he weighed about 75 pounds. He was really pretty. He was not a good dog some of the time. He and I went to obedience school and I had trouble with him jumping on windows and tearing up flower beds. If you ever had a dog, you know about that stuff. He'd been punished plenty of times. But all of that was out the window when his master was hurting and he sat down next to me and he began to lick my cheeks and just be there. Now, I know he's a dog. But I think God was in that event. And I think that's a, a way that we can start to understand what God's calling us to do. We can't fix the world's problems. But we can care that the world has problems. We can't necessarily offer a solution for every dilemma that somebody has, but we can be there to hear their dilemma. We can let them know they're not alone. We can demonstrate for them what it's like to have Christ show up in their life. That's the way it was for the demoniac. That's the way it was for the woman at the well. They didn't deserve what Christ gave them. But he gave it anyway. And he tells us in the Gospel of John, he says, you go into all the world and make disciples. And we want to do that. We're, we're energetic Americans. We can make disciples. And there are books full of how to do that down at Barnes Noble. Let me tell you, you can't make a disciple if you're not a disciple. Mm -hmm. Sheep make sheep. They don't make cows. And so somehow we've got to balance our act between growing spiritually so that our actions are the way God sees them so we can be a part of this final part of the scripture. I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit. The fruit of their doings. People ask me all the time, how do you know what your spiritual gift is? Well, when your gift bears fruit, then you know. And sometimes our logic gets in the way. Old John Wesley, on May the 24th of whatever year it was, went to a meeting with some people he was kind of burnt out on. You ever been to one of those? Yeah, <laughs> haven't we all? He went to hear something he already knew. You ever been to one of those? Yeah. And what he was hearing was the preface to Romans by, John, by Martin Luther, which he probably knew word for word. 
And even in that event where he was in a place he really didn't want to go to with some people he didn't care that much for, and here it's something he already knew, God used that event that day to warm his heart. And he knew, John Wesley knew that day on May the 24th, we celebrate that every year, on May the 24th, he knew that his heart was strangely warmed, that Jesus died just for him. And sometimes I think we need to be reminded of that. It doesn't matter where we've been. It doesn't matter what you did. Because if you hadn't have done everything you did, if you hadn't met the people, experienced the experiences, done all the stuff you've ever done, you probably wouldn't be here right now. Amen. That is who you are. But that experience can, even today, assure you that Jesus died even for you. And when you know it, you know it. And sometimes even though you know it, you need to be reminded of it because we get out into the world and we're so focused on everything else, we forget the good stuff. We forget how much work Jesus did to get us to this place. That he willingly gave up his life to pay a price for the sins that we would later commit. No greater gift than to give up one's life for a friend. Amen. The problem we have is we want to have an exclusive friendship. And God calls us to have a wider scope to reach further into the wilderness to go into all the world, all of the surrounding communities. But here's the sad part, friends. We don't have to go far. We don't have to go far out of the shadow of this building. Bishop Jones, our current bishop, said one time, there are people living in hell all around your church. Do you care enough to do anything about it? And most of us don't think we can rescue anybody from hell. And we can't. But we can invite them into a relationship with the one who can. Jesus saves. We invite. We make available. We offer the opportunity. And we tell the old, old story. Years ago, I was preaching in Happy Harbor Methodist Home in LaPorte, Every Sunday afternoon, I was in seminary, and so I was busy. I was got to be off to Dallas for the week. I told them one week, I told all these people, they were, uh, some of them, <laughs> there were some, so many funny stories. There was a lady one day, she was, uh, she was pretty much in a coma, but they had her in a wheelchair, and they are listening to the sermon because they didn't have anything else to do. And so during the middle of my great message, she started going like this in the middle of the And I thought, maybe the Holy Spirit's really doing something here. She just woke up. <laughs> I told him, I told him one week, I said, next week, I'm going to be really pressed, so I'm probably going to just have to tell the old, old story. This 85-year-old lady stood up the back. She said, preacher, that's the only story we want to hear, <laughs> is the old, old story. Yep. You know what was amazing? Some of those people had dementia. They were out of their mind. But you'd start singing those songs we sang today. They do all the works. Absolutely. Sometimes it's, it's not just the sermon. Sometimes it's the prayer. Or sometimes it's the fellowship. Or, or sometimes it's the other stuff that happens in church. Often it's the music that takes us to the place where we can feel that feeling. Prior to John Wesley, the world looked at religion as something that was, it was related to the scripture and tradition and reason. And John Wesley brought into the, to the thing experience. Friends, I don't know how to get you to have it, but I want you to have an experience that in your heart you know. You feel it to your bones that you are saved by the grace and mercy of the gift of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you don't know it, that's okay. Because that time can come. You keep going, you keep pursuing, you keep chasing it down. The last thing I ever heard Bishop Norris 
say when he was up at Lakeview one time, I was a very new preacher in the conference, and so I had this woman sitting next to me, and I didn't know who she was, but I later found out who she was, and we were singing from hymnals, and so I just reached over and shared my hymnal with her, because that's what you do when somebody doesn't have one. My boss, who was my senior pastor, reached over into my ear and said, you're singing with the bishop's wife. <laughs> Be careful what you say. <laughs> and about them, Bishop Norris, he was a, a big man, and he had this booming voice that every preacher wishes they had. And he said, this is my last sermon I'm ever going to preach for you guys. And <laughs> Dr. Mackey said, oh, my Lord, <laughs> under her breath. But, you know, here's what he said, and I, this rings true for me even today. He said, you know, I believe that Jesus really lived on this planet. And I believe he was really persecuted and died. And I believe that he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And I know that some of you have trouble with some part of that belief. He's talking to preachers. He said, that's okay. He said, because I believe it. Go forward with my belief until it becomes your belief. The Moravians told John Wesley the same thing. They said, preach faith until you get it, and then preach faith because you have it. Friends, I want you to experience the loving, merciful grace given to each one of us by Jesus Christ. And you'll know when you know. And if you haven't known it yet, you'll know it's coming. Keep moving forward. Keep doing the work. Do it even when you don't feel like it. Go even when you don't want to. And we have the example of our friend John Wesley, who even though everything was against him that night, he felt the presence of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That same preacher one time told me, he says, you know, when you end a sermon, you've got to have a call to action. He said, you've got to give them something to do. Want something to do? Go make disciples. Live faith until you get it. And then live faith because you have it. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we conclude our service today, we're going to sing, I don't know, several. How many is it, AJ? Um, four, I think. Four verses of Jesus Loves Me. No, I know three, every, three. three. Everybody knows the first one, but we're going to sing all of them today because I think Jesus really does love you and me. He died for us all, for my sin and yours. As you're able, would you stand as we sing together? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible. Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago, taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Still today, do you believe that? Walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. table of the
back. There are some hot pink tickets for the chili dinner coming up. Take some. As many as we can pre-sell helps us do all of the stuff we have to do for our chili dinner. It's May the uh, March the 4th, and it's going to be from 11 in the morning until 7 in the evening. You can come and get your food anytime you want during the day. Uh, it has been a joy to be with you today. we got a beautiful day. I understand there's a big game. I know you want to get home and be involved in that, maybe. Uh, I'm probably going to go feed cows. So, <laughs> you know, that's the way that works for me. Friends, it is the love of God that created all that we see. It's the power of Jesus Christ's teaching that show us how to be. But it will be the Holy Spirit that hangs in with us to go from this place and be the human doings that he's called us to be. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.